Good morning, everybody. Um, we are very excited, and it's our pleasure to welcome you to BioCycle East Coast 17 here in, in Maryland. I'm Nora Goldstein. I'm editor of BioCycle, and on behalf of the entire BioCycle team uh, and, and our sponsors, we, we welcome you here today. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank the sponsors that we have for, for the conference, uh, the U.S. Composting Council, a diamond sponsor, NTU Onsite Energy is our silver sponsor, uh, bronze sponsors, Comtech America, Americas and Plexus uh, Recycling Technologies, uh, and then Copper's Coker Composting and Consulting, and Friends of BioCycle, uh, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance in the Maryland Department of the Environment. So, Thank you all for your generous support of the, uh, of the conference. So a couple of, of uh, highlights. I just want to point everybody to your, the March-April issue of BioCycle that's in your packet has previews of some of the, the presentations we have here today and also um, Two of the three keynotes uh, are written up here, and then just wanted to bring your attention to the January issue. We had uh, Big Apple Goes Big on Organics Recycling, uh, and that really gives you a real up-to-date look at where where the program is, and but it's, it evolves daily, so it's exciting to see that. Uh, breaks, every break, uh, refreshment breaks, lunch, this evening's reception will be in the Grand Ballroom, uh, where you, you probably just were. And if you're staying with us for the tour on Friday, the bus, tour bus, we have one bus, will be out in front of the hotel where you came in to, you know, to register. And just wanted to highlight the theme of, of this conference is growing the organics recycling industry. And we really believe that the technologies, the solutions, the services, the combined knowledge, uh, the will is really been proven. We have all the tools we really need to advance and grow organics recycling. And more and more to talk about our industry as solution providers, not just a landfill alternative. But we're really providing solutions on multiple fronts. Uh, Clean water, healthy soils, renewable energy, um, and that just comes together very strongly. And really, wants we want that to be, you know, a big message uh, coming out of these the, these conferences. So, uh, the, these three days. So, uh, with that, we're going to get started. <laughs> And, and it is a pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Catherine Garcia, who was appointed in 20, March 2014 as commissioner of the New York City Department of Sanitation by Mayor Bill de Blasio. Uh, commissioner Garcia leads the world's largest municipal waste management agency and its 9,700 uniformed and civilian employees who are also responsible for snow removal. So we were very grateful that uh, this is the last week that they're on snow duty, I guess, and so we, were, we lucked out. Uh, after her appointment as commissioner, uh, Commissioner Garcia set an ambitious long-term goal for New York City to contribute zero waste to landfills and really have, has accelerated and expanded the kinds of programs. Prior to becoming uh, commissioner of DSNY, uh, she was the Chief Operating Officer at the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. So with that, let's welcome Catherine Garcia, Commissioner of DSNY. Thank you, Nora, and thank you, BioCycle, for having, for having me. So um, we are actually very bullish on organics in New York City and are working towards building the largest organics program in the country. But who are we? Um, so I did when I accepted the invitation to speak say, if it snows, I can't come. Uh, and we did end up having a relatively late storm in the middle of March, and that is, many people think of us as the largest waste 
municipal waste organization, but in many ways we're set up to be the largest snow removal operation. Uh, so we are collecting and removing over 10,000 tons of refuse every day and about 2,000 tons of the traditional recycling materials, metal, glass, plastic, cartons, paper. Um, we have five marine transfer stations from under construction from actually operational, as well as three compost facilities. Some of you operate them are here today. But every week, New Yorkers are throwing away on average 15 pounds of garbage at home and another 9 pounds at work in a commercial establishment. One of the things that big commercial buildings are finding is they are receiving a lot of Amazon boxes these days at the office that they did not receive you know, in prior years because people aren't home to accept all of their prime packaging. But together, that's more than 6 million tons of waste. And I have a staff member who particularly likes the whale. That is 80,000 whales every, every year. Um, unfortunately, a whale did fall up onto the beach and went away yesterday. We were managing that as well. So you never know what, what could actually happen. But how do we get a city that is as diverse, as dense, as complex as we want to achieve the ambitious goal of sending zero waste to landfills by 2030? Well, our first step is really sort of basic. What are we throwing away? Uh, this is our most recent waste characterization, where we pull out trucks and we separate and we count and we weigh. Uh, and we are about to do another waste characterization study to see how things have changed. But as you can see, about 33% is our normal recycling program that everyone's been doing for ages and ages and ages. Um, but the other big opportunity is the organic streams. So that is 31%. That is our next big step. And obviously, we're going after the other smaller pieces with our e-cycle program and with our refashion program, which yesterday we announced <coughs> had each collected over 10 million pounds of material over the last few years. And so we're growing those programs as well. But it's looking at that pie and going after each chunk and figuring out what is the best way to start to divert that material. And it's also about achieving our reducing emissions in New York City. New York City's made very large commitments to get to 80 by 50, so an 80% reduction by 2050. And in the waste sector, the landfill emissions are primarily coming from the organics in the waste stream. And so if we're going to achieve the 80 by 50, this is a big chunk of it. Where have we come from? Well, long, long ago, as Noah was saying, we did an article in the very early 90s about your attempt to uh, do organics in New York City. It wasn't until the late 80s that we even had a real recycling law, um, where we were really doing separation at the curb of metal, glass, plastic, and paper. Um, we tried to do some store-separated food in the early 90s. Uh, it was very challenging. We didn't have a lot of outlets for it, but those were our first steps. And then we started working with community organizations, which I think was very key to being as successful as we've been now. And I'm going to talk a little bit about more about that. Um, and then we had to do a comprehensive solid waste management plan in 2006. Uh, we are still building out the comprehensive solid waste management plan, but one was a further commitment to recycling and to organic. I love how that <laughs> So in 2010, we put, there were local laws that put together uh, studies on food waste composting to make recommendations to the council. Uh, we started in, we missed the first plan YC under Bloomberg in, tw in 2007. Uh, somehow the solid waste sector wasn't included in what is primarily an environmental document, but we made it in in, in 2011 uh, and made it into the mayor's one New York City plan most recently, which articulates how we're going to move this organization to uh, zero by 30. So what is our approach? It is really three levels. Uh, we encourage people in their homes to be doing composting in their homes because it's always better if they keep it in the same way that it's always better if they keep their own storm water, if you have ever been in the uh, water sector. Uh, so everything that happens at the most local level is the most sustainable, and so we want to make sure that we're encouraging that. 
and then in the community sector. But we have a large network of gardens and other large providers who are doing compost and taking material from local neighborhoods and doing a lot of education, a lot of master composter classes. These folks have been really key towards moving the program forward as we get bigger and make this another sort of regular municipal recycling stream. Um, but they're the ones who go out and tell everyone that it's not hard, that it's not icky, uh, that it actually is a very easy thing to do for the earth and really also our showcase at those gardens where you see the food turn into compost, turn into new food, uh, really closing that loop. So we intend to serve all New Yorkers by the end of 2018. So we have our existing curbside program service. Um, the yellow is where we are expanding in 2017. So right now, we are serving just shy of a million people at the curb. And by the end of this year, we will be at 3.3 million. And so we are continuing to expand that. But there are places where if you are in a high-rise building, we are requiring you to apply. Um, because we need to know that your management team will do it too. Uh, and so those places also we are offering drop-off. If we have resistance from the management, we're offering drop-off services for those constituents. On the commercial side, <coughs> we are requiring large generators to source separate their waste. Uh, and so that's all the large stadiums in the city of New York. Uh, the Yankees did not have a good opening day, the Mets did, so um, they're back at the stadiums, but also large food manufacturers, uh, large food wholesalers, as well as large hotels with more than 150 rooms, and we started enforcing that in January. Um, and so this was the first designation that we did in the city of New York to require source separation of food from large commercial establishments. But how are we doing it on the residential side? Um, in some cases, we are using dual bin trucks uh, so that we are collecting the regular refuse on one side and the organics on the other to limit uh, the amount of truck traffic in the city of New York. Uh, always a contentious issue anytime you have additional truck traffic. And then we are also, those are our food drop-offs with the children uh, who bring their food. It's, it's like always surprising to me when I tell people, no, they save it until the weekend, and then they bring it to us. They will do it. Uh, this is not going to work in every single neighborhood. There are some neighborhoods where we will have to run two trucks in order to make the collection work. And it's all about balancing how much waste is on the refuse side, how much waste is on the organic side, what are we seeing to make sure we're being as efficient as possible. And also, not only efficient from an environmental point of view, but from a financial point of view. We also have to be practical about our feedstock. Um, there's some magical thinking in the world of organic diverters, uh, particularly in schools. Uh, it's all, I get these pictures every single morning from the transfer stations about what has uh, been tipped. In schools, one, they have about a bazillion plates. Even they're now compostable, there's very little food in a bazillion plates. But they also, you can see which day was, I don't want to eat my oranges, which day was, I don't want to eat my apples. Uh, but we also are seeing a tremendous amount of yard waste, and that is all getting collected together. So figuring out how to manage those two different types of materials together is something that we have been working very closely with our providers to figure out. Um, but people like that, uh, and actually sanitation with the that. Nobody likes it uh, <coughs> the way that most composters want it, which is pure, no plastics. Uh, they don't. They don't want to touch the food, and it's actually an easier case to make. That we're going to let you use a container, to take it from your kitchen to uh, your brown bin, and it will all stay sealed because they don't like to clean their brown bins. <laughs> what we've discovered, and so they'd rather have it all in a neat little bag. So we are going to get back. So we are. That's something we're going to have to manage, and. Uh, Municipal folks sometimes get other things, and one of my providers here will tell you that, uh -huh, and the cast iron pipe that ended up in there, or the rug. Uh, so some people don't actually know what organic means. 
But we're doing this with a lot of different, so we're, we're very focused on education. We're very focused on close separation. And those are the, one of the other cases we make to the public is this reduces vermin. Um, it actually can reduce those lovely critters called rats that seem to like to live in the city of New York. Because you're not putting out a black bag that's easy for them to chew through, you're putting a, something in a closed container. But we know that we have that feedstock that is not absolutely pure and beautiful. And so we've, we're have we using uh, mechanized processes to debag as well as to um, remove any of the contaminants. And so that's the tiger. Uh, out at Slatten Island Compost Facility, and other providers are using some other technology. So we're excited that this is the direction that we're going in. And so we continue to support regional capacity development, just for those of you who are thinking about making investments. To get in that 100-mile radius, we do and look at how much processing capacity is out there. I am required to designate more commercial establishments to first separate. Um, that is the way the local law is written. The next chunk will be harder because I think that's restaurants, but uh, that is the way the local law is, how, we're, how we are stepping forward to chicken and egg. Do you have the feedstock? Do you have the processing capacity? We're trying to move at a pace that makes it so not neither one gets too far ahead of the other. Uh, but there are new uh, processors developing all the time. Some of them are uh, traditional compost facilities. Some of them are more focused on using digesters, and some are combining both of those. We're making a lot of investment both at a, a more regional level, but also at a local level around our, our infrastructure. And so some of those pictures are the wind rose out of the Staten Island compost facility. We're going to be doing another big investment there uh, soon. The other picture with the little house is actually a compost facility in Red Hook in Brooklyn. And so that those blowers are actually driven by solar power. Uh, and then, of course, those are the beautiful eggs. We didn't invest in those, but the water folks invested in those. But um, they have a lot of extra capacity. And so we are using those eggs for some of the waste coming out of Brooklyn. It's a beautiful view, by the way, from the top. Very lovely. And they allow you to visit on Valentine's Day. <laughs> they had, so if you want to take a date to Newtown Creek, uh, make sure that you're ready to do it because there's quite a few folks who end up signing up. Who knew? Oh, I don't know how many people got engaged. I have yet to hear about that, but we can, we can ask. But we're also engaging New Yorkers in our story. So we're doing a lot of outreach, a lot of advertising, um, also connecting the uniform side of the agency with the program. Um, for a lot of years, it was sort of the uh, frontline sanitation workers, like we fight snow, we pick up garbage. Uh, and then the recycling folks were over here, it's like, oh, those are the environmental people. But having them link has been really important to making this program successful. And then we have lots of outreach folks who get to wear the orange t-shirts all summer long and be out in the field answering questions to the public as we go into new neighborhoods. And then one afternoon, some of my staff decided to work on puns, and it ended up becoming uh, a relatively large advertising campaign, not only on social media, but in bus shelters, on the subway type of things, and then just signage. Um, when we do street play care, when we do uh, gardens to let them know that this is compost that's being made from their food scrap. So that is all I have. I thought I'd give you a very brief overview of what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, everything is challenging. I will say that much. And it's like every time I make a move on the collection truck, I got to talk to the union. Um, you know, every time. We think about how much we're going to be pulling out of the system. I got to think about where are my contracts? How are we paying for this? Uh, how are we saying what's our next from final beneficial use for it? How are we articulating this? How are we getting folks in New York to actually do it? Um, particularly as we venture past the very high performing diversion to the more uh, or the lower diversion neighborhood. So, you know, they haven't been great at metal, glass, and plastic. Now I'm expecting them to be great at organics. But one of the I interesting things I think about the organics program is I actually end up getting more metal, glass, and plastic. Because people empty out that container rather than throwing the whole thing into the garbage. 
um, so, you know, there's some, there some upsides on that as well. Uh, so thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mom. And uh, a new trick, F5. <laughs> really is much less painful to switch. Um, so thank you so much. It's a really good way to open, open the conference to really talk about the realities as well as the opportunities and really um, having spent time with, in New York City with both the community composters and then having the pleasure of following one of the, the curbside trucks back in September. We, we met at the garage very early in the morning and, and had that. It's, it's really impressive. Um, so uh, really in, uh, so important to have the biggest, you're still the biggest in the world. Yeah, you know, this is pretty amazing and growing, so, and growing, so. awesome. So our next